Bears have fired offensive coordinator Shane Waldron. This Bears offense has gone 23 consecutive possessions without scoring a touchdown. 277.7 yards per game ranks as the third worst in the NFL. Offensive passing game coordinator Thomas Brown has been promoted to OC. Caleb Williams got off to a 2-2 two two start this season, but his total QBR was 32, which ranked 29th in the league. Then he went off in, five, in, in weeks 5 and 6. At home games against the Panthers and Jaguars, he posted an NFL best 88 QBR. Had something to do with the opponent. He's come back down to earth in the three games following the Bears' bye week in week seven, ranking dead last in the NFL with a 21 QBR. Let's dive into this as we look who's here today. We've got Dan Orlovsky. We've got Andrew Hawkins here, of course, and we're about to see him. Oh, there they are. There's Marcus Spears. There's Dan Graziano. And there's... <laughs> There's the wave. <laughs> the wave is like its own person, its own <laughs> entity. Graz, what can you tell us about the decision that was made today with Waldron and why they went ahead and did it? Yeah, Laura, I mean, you went through all the issues they've been having trying to score points on offense, and it's gotten to the point when, you, when they have a rookie quarterback, you want to make sure and not rattle his confidence. And I think the Bears feel like that's been happening with Caleb Williams. Uh, so a change had to be made. Now, whether you lay it all at the feet of Shane Waldron or whether he just ended up being the, the scapegoat for it all, uh, we can debate. But the fact of the matter is the Bears uh, have been asking a lot of Caleb Williams. You know, if you look around the league at, at Bo Nix in Denver, at Jaden Daniels in Washington, you see situations where the offense is kind of built in concepts that the player is comfortable with coming out of college and he can kind of fall back on. Uh, whereas Caleb was given a lot. They gave him the playbook to this offense in February at the Combine when they first met him uh, and figured the time uh, would be enough to get him up to speed. But he's struggling with, you know, mastering protections. He's struggling with a lot of things. And there hasn't been anywhere for him to go in terms of a comfort zone. Uh, and they, they feel like they have to change that up. Again, Waldron was the offensive coordinator. They're not scoring enough points. Uh, and sometimes that's, what, that's who gets fired. But whether the problems are deeper than that, uh, we will all find out. When I watch Caleb Williams this year, it, it looks like information overload. Mm. He looks confused. It looks like he's being thrown out there with certain just plays and, and trying to execute them as is or, or, or what is in his, the best of his ability. There's a lack of, like, just operational coaching. And it's not just from him. You could see the confusion from the pass catchers. The, 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 some of the targets pass didn't make sense. Well. So for Caleb Williams, the important thing is that you give him a process to follow in each of the plays. Like, he has to understand and know, even when those opportunities present themselves, the big play will come. Him being able to make sure he doesn't, you know, pass up on the right decision and not getting bored with that is more important than trying to make the big and flashy play. Yeah. Yeah. There were times in the offense that just didn't seem that way. Here's the reality. This is who Caleb has been, though. And yeah. It doesn't mean he's always going to be this, though. But this is who he was in college. I mean, in college, he was a guy that held the ball Forever took a ton of sacks. I mean, on the left side is last year. Time to throw 3.14. That's the second longest in college football. The sacks, interception, the fumbles, 46. That was 10th most in college football, the number one pick. And then this is who he's been this year, holding on to the football for almost three seconds. That's an eternity Ooh. in the NFL. And then that bottom number is the big deal, okay? That 47 sacks, interceptions, and fumbles. Now, I'm not telling everybody this, this is who he's going to be forever. Mm -hmm. I think that's the challenge for Thomas Brown, who's that new play caller, is – you know, Graz says something where they were asking so much of him, and he contrasted it to Drake May and Bo Nix. Bo Nix is actually the, the contrast that I and point Jayden to. Daniels. And Jaden Daniels. And Jaden Daniels, correct. But when you watch what Denver does with Bo, it is literally one thing. Look at that one guy, and he'll tell you what to do. I think for Thomas Brown, it's like you got to build in things that don't ask him to think. Don't even give him the chance yeah. to think. You're yeah. throwing the ball there. Like a perimeter screen, mm -hmm. an RPO, where there's not – I'm trying to look at three or four different guys. That's the challenge immediately in Chicago. Yeah, D.O., and, and that's what shows up on tape. I like what Hawk said about overload, right? Because when you see him, it looks like confusion from the pocket. And even when he's holding the ball, it seems like he's still trying to figure out what to do and where to go. I had two examples of just situational things that happen. First one to me is about Shane Waldron. This I know you're stinks. running this, trying to run this little comeback into the boundary. That's horrible. You put him in a terrible situation. This is the one on Caleb, though, right? You go through the progression. It's a triangle over there. The defenders got you. Turn your eyes quickly and throw for four yards. He still goes get the first down, but you want to see him let that ball go to that slot receiver for a fourth and fourth down. Those are some examples. It's littered. 
throughout here. And then I agree with you 100%. I heard you talk about this with Patrick Mahomes. And the only reason I bring up Mahomes is because we had a lot of comparisons to Mahomes with Caleb coming out of college. Mahomes played that way, but he had Andy Reid to, to be decisive for him on the sideline until he took that next step. We had that conversation. Teams are making you throw the ball underneath. Teams are now taking away the deep ball, and we know that Pat wanted to be explosive, and we saw him progress as a quarterback, and you talked about that a lot. That's what this kid needs now as yeah. opposed to trying to play big home run ball as opposed to the moving it downfield. No rookie quarterback should be holding the ball for five seconds. Especially One of the goals is to get the ball out of their hands. Get these breather completions that I consistently talk about where you do We call them Siri. Call it, run it. Look at these stats. Holding the ball for five seconds or longer. Dropbacks. He's doing it the most. Pressured. He's, he's inviting the yeah. pressure. So, again, I, I – that's kind of who he's been. I yeah. think the other thing is this. If I was Thomas Brown and I was the, the Bears moving forward, I would use this graphic and I would sit Caleb down and get him to realize how impactful one sack is per drive. When you get sacked in per this drive. league, you're done. Look at the difference between getting a sack and not getting a sack. On the left side, you're getting sacked. You're getting a point and a half more when you don't. Taking a sack versus a throwaway is quite literally the difference between us scoring yeah. points and not. And once you get him to understand that, I think he'll release the, I guess, like the, the negative connotation with an incompletion. And I mean, the ball it's, it's NFL football, and mm -hmm. we all know this. Marcus, Dan, you know this too. You can't unlock what you're capable of until you show the ability to unlock what you're supposed until to you do. Show it. Right? That, there's, there's a process to it. I right. tell my son, it stands mm -hmm. and start, and then you can show right. what ability you have after that. The talent never matters the talent until you never start there. Until you start there. Yeah. You talk about sacks, too. It makes me think he's got to protect himself as well in some ways. Like, he, sure. they've invested so much in him. Graz, what does this tell us about the future of the rest of that coaching staff in Chicago? <laughs> well, yeah. look, it obviously calls it into question. I mean, look, it, it, it is November 12th. Uh, if you had asked on November 12th last year, most people would have said, no way Matt Eberflus is back as head coach of the Bears, and it turns out he was. So we don't know how it's going to go. All of that said, this will be a spot at the end of the season that people will be watching for potential change because of the fact that they, they've already thrown two offensive coordinators overboard since Matt Eberflus has been there, because of the fact that they're heavily invested in a young quarterback whose success is integral to the future of the franchise. Uh, and you would think they look around the division, the Bears do, right? You have young star offensive coaches in Minnesota and Green Bay. You have the master culture builder uh, in Detroit. Uh, you're trying to get a stadium built, get excitement about your team. I think it would be uh, not surprising to a lot of people if the Bears ended up looking for someone quarterback centric uh, who could get people fired up about the team. Yeah, to this point in the season, by the way, the Bears have played the easiest schedule in the NFL, according to ESPN Analytics. Now they have the hardest remaining schedule. So it doesn't look like it's going to get much better from here no matter what happens. But we'll keep an eye on it. <laughs>